Hello, I'm Dr. Mehul Zanoja. I'm a consultant cardiologist uh, and electrophysiologist working here at the London Independent Hospital and also at uh, St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. I'm going to be talking about catheter ablation uh, procedure for atrial fibrillation, uh, which is one of the commonest heart rhythm problems uh, in the world. The majority of patients who get atrial fibrillation usually complain of palpitations or breathlessness and sometimes dizziness. And for many of these people, these symptoms can be extremely debilitating and dramatically lower their quality of life. In the first instance, the current practice is to treat people with tablets, which are usually fine for a while, but ultimately, after a period of about 12 to 18 months, most patients, despite taking the tablets, start getting problems with the atrial fibrillation again. At that point, the best treatment for these people is to undergo an atrial fibrillation ablation procedure. What I'm going to describe now is the principles of the procedure and in order to help me do this I've got a, a heart model here. So what we can see here is a heart uh, from the front and essentially the heart has got four chambers. There's a top chamber and a bottom chamber on the right side and a top chamber and a bottom chamber on the left side. Now for atrial fibrillation the key chamber out of these four is this top chamber on the left and I'm now just going to turn the heart round so we're looking at it from the back and the top chamber on the left which is this yellow structure here is called the left atrium and the left atrium's got four very important pipes running into it which are these structures here and these four pipes are called pulmonary veins and their job is to bring blood back into the heart after it's actually circulated through the lungs and picked up oxygen. Now we know that in patients who get attacks of atrial fibrillation, this is known as paroxysmal fibrillation, we know that in three quarters of those patients, the irritability and the abnormal electrical activity that results in the atrial fibrillation originates in one of these four pulmonary veins. And so when we perform a catheter ablation procedure for atrial fibrillation, what we're working on is these four pulmonary veins at the back of the heart and the aim of the procedure is to electrically isolate these veins from the rest of the heart. And when you do that, it gives these patients relief from their atrial fibrillation in up to 90% of cases. And those patients, the vast majority of them, can stop taking their tablets as well. There are another group of patients with atrial fibrillation who are in atrial fibrillation all the time and this is called persistent atrial fibrillation. And in those patients, again, we know that these four pulmonary veins are very, very important. But in addition to that, the heart muscle within the left atrium also undergoes a lot of electrical and structural changes, which means that rather than the atrial fibrillation coming and going spontaneously, uh, the heart's actually in the abnormal rhythm all of the time. And again, in those patients, we also perform ablation procedures to maintain the heart in a normal rhythm, which is successful in up to 70% of cases. Now the principle behind the uh, ablation procedure I can now demonstrate by um, opening up the left atrium from the front. And if you now look inside the heart, you can see that there are the, uh, the four pulmonary veins right here, which are these four red dots. And when we actually perform an atrial fibrillation ablation procedure, what we're actually doing is we're placing very discrete burns around the mouths of the veins. And I've drawn these with these green dots. You can actually see here around the left-sided veins, there are these ring of dots around the veins here and around the right-sided veins here. Again, you can see a ring of green dots. And these represent the very discrete bones. They're only a few millimeters in diameter that we place around the mouth of the veins. And the effect of doing this is to me, it, what it does essentially is that it prevents any abnormal electrical activity from inside the veins. It stops that electrical activity from actually coming out of the veins into the heart and putting the heart into atrial fibrillation because the minute the abnormal impulse tries to emerge from the veins, it actually collides with this ring of burns that we place around the vein. And since you know, the, the, the tissue that's been, heart tissue that's been ablated doesn't conduct electricity anymore, although the veins are firing off abnormal impulses, the heart still remains in a normal rhythm. And that's the principle of the ablation procedure. For patients that have actually got persistent fibrillation, in other words, their heart's irregular all of the time, as well as doing the ablation rings around the veins, we have to do a lot more ablation elsewhere inside the heart because the heart muscles also undergone some abnormal changes because of the irregular rhythm. And again, you can see the sorts of 
um, burns that we place inside the heart. Again, if you look uh, inside the left atrium, you can see this row of green dots going over the roof of the chamber, linking up the two rings. And in addition to that, if you look down into the chamber, you can see some further burns in the floor of the heart and extending down into the valve. Some patients um, undergo even more extensive ablation for their persistent fibrillation, which can also involve the right atrium here uh, at the front of the heart. But the aim of the procedure in all patients is to actually bring some order to the cha chaotic electrical activity within the left atrium and restore the heart to a normal rhythm. And that is the principle of the uh, ablation procedure for atrial fibrillation. So I'm now just going to say a little bit about what would happen to you as the patient when you come in for your atrial fibrillation ablation procedure. One very important cornerstone for the procedure is to have a highly trained, specialized team uh, to, to cover all aspects of the procedure. And we're very lucky here at the London Independent Hospital that we have an excellent, highly trained team who I work with here within the catheter laboratories. And essentially, a member of the team will be contacting you about a week before your procedure in the pre-assessment clinic to do all the routine checks that we perform on all patients before undergoing a procedure like this. One of the most important things that I always insist on when I do one of these procedures is that you take warfarin for at least four weeks before the procedure and for at least three months afterwards. But the most important thing is that your, your blood is adequately thinned on the warfarin for the four weeks before and the entire ablation procedure is performed on warfarin. We do not stop warfarin um, for the procedure, which I think is much nicer for you as the patient and I think that makes the procedure a lot safer and easier to perform. You will then be admitted to the London Independent Hospital on the morning of your procedure. The procedure will then be performed either using a full general anaesthetic or sometimes we use local anaesthesia with heavy sedation. No matter which kind of sedation you receive, the most important thing for us is to make sure that you're relaxed, pain-free and comfortably asleep throughout the entire procedure. And we take great pains to ensure that that happens for all of our patients. Once you then come down into the operating room here for your procedure, one of the first things we do is once you're comfortably asleep, we pass a very small telescope uh, into the food pipe, which allows us to take very detailed images uh, of the left atrium, which is the chamber that we've just been looking at on the model at the back of the heart. And this is just to be absolutely sure that there are no clots inside the left atrium, because if there are, then of course, we wouldn't do the procedure on that day. Once we're happy with those pictures, we then actually start by putting some uh, tubes uh, into the veins at the top of the right leg. I generally tend to put only three tubes in after I've injected some local anaesthetic at the top of the right leg and this allows us to introduce specialized wires which have got platinum electrodes on the end called catheters into the heart um, which allows us to record electrical signals from the heart and also to actually place the burns inside the heart. And here you can actually see uh, some of the catheters that we would normally put inside the heart to do the procedure. Uh, this one here is a spiral catheter, which has actually got 20 electrodes on it. And this is actually positioned inside one of the pulmonary veins at the back of the heart. And it allows us to record electrical signals inside the heart. And then once the ablation has been completed, we'll know that the veins are electrically silent because this catheter doesn't record signals anymore. We also have this catheter that we normally position into a vein inside the heart called the coronary sinus, which allows us to record electrical signals from there which is very, very helpful uh, information when we do the ablation procedure. In many ways, the most important catheter is this one, which is called an ablation catheter. And in addition to recording electrical signals from the uh, platinum tips there, we can also actually bend it using this uh, hand control here. You can see it forms a bend. And this allows us to reach all parts of the left atrium. And when we pass a very high frequency electrical current down this catheter, the tip of the catheter heats up to about 40 to 50 degrees centigrade, which allows us to place these very precise, discrete burns on the inside of the heart uh, to perform the ablation. The entire ablation procedure is actually guided by the use of two what we call mapping computers, and you can actually see these uh, to my left here. Uh, one of the computers is this system here, which is a three-dimensional mapping computer, which is known as CARTO. And we're very lucky here at the London Independent Hospital in that we have the latest version uh, of this system, uh, which has got some very important innovations in it, which I'll describe in a moment, that make the procedure a lot safer and easier to perform. And then further behind there, we have a, another 
uh, mapping system that we, that we use, uh, which is known as the BARD mapping system. And you can just see there on the left-hand screen some electrical signals that I've recorded uh, during a, a case that I did uh, recently. And the yellow signals that you can see there represent the electrical signals from inside the pulmonary veins. The white signals are the signals from the tip of the ablation catheter. And then on the right-hand screen, you can actually see that the yellow signals um, have completely disappeared, and that's what we would expect to see uh, at the end of the procedure when the pulmonary veins are silent. If we now actually go onto the, uh, the CARTO mapping computer, we can actually see uh, in this patient um, two images. And on the left-hand screen, we can actually see an image of the left atrium looked at from the front of the patient. And on the right-hand screen, we can see an image of the left atrium looked at from the right of the patient. And we actually create these images uh, during the procedure by actually positioning the catheters inside the heart. And here you can actually see an image of the spiral catheter inside the heart and inside one of the pulmonary veins. And then it's a three-dimensional mapping computer, so we can actually move this image around 360 degrees, which allows us to actually navigate the catheters inside the heart with minimal use of x-rays, um, which makes the procedure a lot easier and safer to perform. And in this particular patient, you can see here at the back of the heart, there are two veins coming off the back of the heart here, which are the left-sided pulmonary veins. And around the veins, you can actually see these brown dots, which are actually the, the burns that have been placed around the, those veins there. And over here, you can actually see the, the right-sided pulmonary veins. Here are the veins that are just coming out of the heart here. And again, you can see a ring of blue dots going around the mouth of the pulmonary veins, which are the burns that have been placed around the veins to make those veins electrically silent. Because we have the latest generation of uh, the CARTO mapping system, one very uh, important piece of information that it gives us um, is a, uh, a reading of the force that is actually recorded from the tip of the ablation catheter. And just to remind you, that's this catheter that I uh, showed you a moment ago. So it's the catheter that we use to actually perform the ablation with. And in the latest generation of system, the tip of the catheter actually has a special sensor. And so this records the amount of force that the catheter is actually applying to the inner surface of the heart. And this is actually represented as a number which comes up on the CARTO screen during the procedure. And this allows us, therefore, to make sure that we're applying enough pressure to the inner wall of the heart so that we get properly placed burns um, but at the same time, it, it tells us if we're actually applying too much pressure to the inner surface of the heart. This therefore allows us to perform the procedure a lot quicker than before, and I think that the procedure is much, much safer with the use of this latest technology. In most patients, the ablation procedure takes about three to four hours. At the end of the procedure, the heart's usually in a normal rhythm, and we will then wake you up, and you will go over to the intensive care unit uh, to be recovered. You usually spend the night on the intensive care unit and you will return uh, to your ward first thing in the morning. The majority of patients are usually up and about walking the following morning. Um, we then tend to allow most patients to go home mid to late morning the following day. So you're in hospital for about 24 hours for this procedure. I generally advise patients uh, to take at least two or three days off work simply because uh, the top of the right leg where we've actually put the tubes in is usually a little bit sore. Some patients also get some chest pain for about a week to 10 days after the procedure, but that's nothing to worry about and it usually settles with some regular painkillers. I usually recommend that you continue, continue your atrial fibrillation tablets for around two months after the procedure because the heart's usually quite irritable uh, because of all the ablation that we've done. But if after two months you've had no further atrial fibrillation and you've had no further palpitations, I recommend that you stop your atrial fibrillation tablets at that point. You must always continue the warfarin until you come back and see me in clinic, which will be at about three to four months after the procedure. And that's usually the first uh, time check that we have for how successful the procedure's been. As I said earlier, in the majority of patients, uh, we have success rates uh, between 70 and 90% for this procedure. And the majority of those patients will be able to stop their atrial fibrillation tablets. Many of them will also be able to stop their warfarin, though not all of them. Finally, it is 
a complex ablation procedure and although, although the success rates are high and we have the latest technology here, as with any kind of invasive procedure, there's always a few small risks involved. For an atrial fibrillation ablation procedure, the risks are as follows. There's a risk of between 2 to 3 percent of potentially having a stroke either during the procedure or in the week to 10 days afterwards and it's for that reason that we insist that you take warfarin uh, for the run-up uh, to the procedure and that your warfarin level is very good for at least a month before. Um, you're on warfarin during the procedure and for at least three months afterwards and this minimizes the risk of the procedure. Although stroke during the procedure uh, is uncommon, uh, it is a very important risk in the procedure and we take great care to make sure uh, that the risk of that is minimized. Most other potentially serious complications from the procedure are now uh, less than 1% incidence and this really is because of the latest technology that we have available to do this procedure. So to summarize, atrial fibrillation ablation in the last 10 years has rapidly become the mainstay of treatment for those individuals who've got atrial fibrillation that is causing either palpitations, breathlessness, or dizzy spells, and for those patients in whom those symptoms are not well controlled with the use of heart rhythm tablets. For all of those patients, by far and away the best treatment for them is to undergo an atrial fibrillation ablation procedure.